Tere päevast. Tere. Good afternoon and welcome. This is the end of the uh, year seminar. Uh, this is a traditional event. I'm sure this is the best thing you can do over the next couple of hours. This event is uh, titled Europe in Year 2022. Is the crisis over or is it just beginning? So we shall sum up this year uh, in the European Union, which has been uh, quite interesting. And let's see how things can get even more exciting next year. Is it going to be full of uh, more events or is it just going to be more peaceful? Uh, my name is Eric Mora. I represent AST Express and today's event can be uh, followed in Estonia and also in English on the website of the European Commission Estonian Representation Office. And so when we start the discussions, all the participants here and over the web, you can send us the questions over the Slido environment. So it's uh, www.slido.do or slido.com. And it's the uh, hashtag Europa2022. Uh, so you can see uh, the password also on the screen right now. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Glenn Yaras, uh, Director of the EU Affairs at the Government Office. Please, Glenn, the floor is yours. Dear European friends, and of course, we would have liked to see you all here at the Kai Arts Center today, physically present, but things are as they are. And we should uh, quote Churchill here, you never miss with Churchill, that this is not the end, this is not the beginning of the end, but we can hope that this is the uh, end of the beginning. So. Uh, we were hoping for the herd immunity uh, in Europe, across the European Union. We more or less reached the goal, but in Estonia, currently not really. And we have the new variant present as well. So maybe this also shows us that we can seek for answers in Europe, but we need to involve the whole world because without that, we do not get the suitable results because the uh, virus will continue doing what viruses do. Ortas uh, said that this year is like a roller coaster. But one of the key words we remember is crisis, uh, which has uh, taken new turns. In addition to the health crisis, we have seen that, well, the climate crisis is still here. Uh, energy crisis is uh, something which is a new thing now at the end of the year. And there are new questions whether this is a natural development or is it uh, deliberate. Based on that, we have also additional inflation. Hybrid crisis is something we've been experiencing in our neighborhood at the eastern border. And the end of the year is uh, we see also military threat at the border of the uh, Ukraine and ultimatum from our neighbor to the east. So the crises have not disappeared anywhere. And uh, our resilience and state defense are important words. And this is not only about the military state defense, but it has uh, permeated other topics as well, including internal market, um, supply chains, and everything else, uh, considering the uh, uh, backdrop of the polarizing world. Another important uh, key word which would, uh, uh, would cover this uh, yeah, are all the transitions of uh, green transition, the power transition, everything else. We would have liked to see the uh, beginning of the 7th of January because we know the 6th of January there is an attack on the Capitolium uh, at the Capitol building and the, we maybe democracy and the rule of law is not doing so well. So we have a lot of discussions across the world and across Europe. And all these topics are also covered here. Einstein has been... Uh, uh, a credit to this uh, quote that he, uh, the definition of lunacy saying uh, that um, doing the same thing over and over, we expect to get a different result. It's not actually his sentence, but it sounds good. But um, things can be done uh, differently. There was a book 
uh, by uh, Mariana Mazzucato, which is called The Mission Economy. This is the translated book this year. Maybe this is not a completely different world. Uh, Marek Dam and Jean-Éric Paquet will discuss it today, that these are the things we're going to do. So these are the missions which uh, bring together private sector and public sector in a new way, which gives us hope for the next year. So we'll continue our work, and I would like to invite Eric and Marek to come back here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, welcome to Marek. Now, um, you have already have this book. Maybe you have it earlier than many uh, other people who have had access to it. So first of all, you are now a uh, freshly minted academician. So congratulations. And I have a simple question. This book by uh, Mariana Matsukata, what does it actually say? It's not difficult to say because Matsukata's uh, uh, mission is uh, the um, message is very clear, and uh, she has two objectives here. Because on one hand, she wants to reassess the relations between the public and private sector, especially if we look at the economics. Because if we think that the innovation is led by private sector, then Matsukato says that this is only part of the truth. And the public sector has a very important role to play when it comes to leading the uh, innovation in economy. And this cooperation between two sectors is the key. And second, and not no less uh, important, is the capitalism and reforms. She says that capitalism has reached the dead end. We need to redefine it. And this book, The Mission Economy, is an attempt to rethink the capitalist society because she has had two previous books about enterprising state and the value of everything. So this is an introduction, the way she sees the economy. So the way Matsukato describes things, maybe it's the same thing as you already mentioned, but in a slightly difficult key, that this is a classical capital opposition to capitalism uh, among the academic circles, but now it's just been described in a better um, uh, bit of way. But what is particular about Matsukato that she is in practical consultancy because she consults many businesses, many uh, organizations, many states. She was a special counsel there for the European Commission. Uh, and if you look at the research and development policy, because then you can see Matsukato's fingerprints all over it. So uh, one thing we see is this mission, uh, because uh, maybe it's not saying it mission in Estonia and it's not, doesn't always work very well. But this is the cornerstone for her scientific approach. But the question is that she talks about mission in the economy and the role of the public sector when innovating the economy. And she also talks about uh, research. So does it really, is it really well combined that you're in a service of a bigger mission? Of course, because our economy is uh, research or science based, and that makes us different compared to the previous um, manufacturing based economic uh, economic models. And Matsukato shows that this uh, mission centric uh, approach is universal. It's ancient because we have to set goals, we need to know where we're going. And her favorite uh, example is the Apollo mission take people to the moon. Specific deadlines, uh, budget, uh, mission, and we've done it. And and she says that we have a we have a shortage of these missions um, nowadays, and she had um, proposals. Let's invent a cancer cure for cancer. Let's uh, get rid of the microplastics in the oceans. So very specific goals. We needs funding. Let's do it. And this kind of thinking works because we have mission-based thinking. For example, the cure for cancer. Estonian scientists are involved there as well. And he will read this book. What is the mission for Estonia? What are these things we want to do in Estonia for a certain deadline, uh, looking at the optimal resources? So what are they? It's a good question. 
I can see it's a challenge right now because our uh, brightest are working on uh, furnishing the new uh, development, the research plan with the uh, with the ideas because they have to be mission focused. And if I understood correctly, that uh, the, uh, during the next year this mission should be clarified. They should also reach the research and development council. That means the government level, and then we would know what the mission of Estonia is until 20. 35. I'm part of these working groups as well and have reached the mission which said that um, surviving Estonian language is this the big goal then. But if we were to think about it, because our society and culture is language based and it's obvious that the biggest challenge in Estonia is not to teach Estonian to non-Estonians, but we uh, teach Estonian to non-humans. So the French and a coffee maker has to speak Estonian. How the into the things could be Estonian language based, and how the big corporations would have enough resources of Estonian language so they would be willing to offer Estonian language support in the uh, smart devices. And this is a mission. But if you think that we uh, uh, need to make sure our education system is in Estonia. We still, there's a danger that our science is English uh, language based because uh, all the doctoral thesis and all the science is in English. <laughs> and there's a very big danger because if our language is only the kitchen language and not a science language anyway, Estonian language could be one of the missions, but there are many other missions as well. For example, a green transition, digital tr transition, and the many other missions as well. But what exactly? I think this is one of the biggest debates for the public discussions for the upcoming coming months. I would ask again, uh, I understand when it comes to the language, it's things are developing further. But when it comes to the green transition, what should be the mission of the Estonian research? And where do we have this uh, room for doubt and criticism and everything else? It's a very good question because the mission has a, a certain indicators. It has to be ambitious but realistic. and. It has to be inspiring. It has to be uh, socially relevant. But it also has to be based on the best scientific knowledge. And uh, what is very important was what Matsukato says as well. You don't have to offer simplistic solutions, but there could be sim uh, different paths to solution and bottom-up approach. So I think that the role of the researchers is to um, make sure that the state-of-the-art knowledge and offer critical thinking as well, not just to have one uh, card you play on. When it came to the Apollo mission, it had some problems as well. It wasn't uh, all about success, although it was successful at the end. But how we can interlink uh, researchers, uh, the businesses, and the public sector, then it's complicated. We do not have many positive examples. And it's important to know how to set a horizon as well. In Estonia, we, don't, we can't really aim for stop climate warning or uh, stop the microplastics in the oceans. We have to set our own level ambitions, which are suitable for Estonia. When it comes to practice, uh, could it be that it means we will express the mission, we uh, provide financing, and then the researchers will get involved in this, but then the outcome is not there? Well, we can't. Uh, well, we know that some missions fail, uh, that it wasn't guaranteed that people reach the moon either, but if you do not try, you will not succeed. And the mission has to be realistic, and there has to be a deadline. So there has to be a deadline set, and I think that this is going to make it realistic. And when it comes uh, to our mission, is the final, final end goal, but there are all sorts of uh, unpredictable uh, cofactors which are which are often positive. So when it came to about Apollo mission, that somebody reached the moon, but during this process, there are many other industries got a lot of new inventions which influence our lives so far. So the part of the mission is that it's a multifaceted and can create uh, unexpected dynamics. What kind of shift do we need in governance to make sure that these missions are successful? Well, I would say that organizing a mission is the highest level of management. And Masukato's message is that if we give new meaning to the capitalist uh, model, then we need to give new meaning to management structure. And that is quite a challenge for Estonia. We want to be small and dynamic, but experience with 
uh, ambitious uh, nationwide project management is uh, scarce. And uh, well, after joining the EU and NATO, we haven't really had these big goals. And the experience of setting big goals and motivating everybody in the public sector to reach that common goal. But I see no other option but to try. And we learn from mistakes. How to convince society that the mission that uh, you agree on somewhere in a committee somewhere is worthy of moving in that direction. Well, it must be such a good mission that it speaks to society. But um, from my own aspect um, of uh, sociology, uh, well, uh, we are dreaming of digital and uh, green uh, transition, but it will never happen before we convince society that it's necessary. And social scientists who know how people think, how they behave, how uh, people consume can make it happen. So it's about interpretation to your own people, uh, translating big missions to society. This is what culture um, and uh, social sciences uh, specialists do. With the crisis that Glenn referred to in the beginning, are you optimistic that this is something to uh, plan systemically for? Gramsci has said that uh, positivism of the heart and pessimism of the mind. So I am a bit skeptical, but I know that we need to make an effort. Uh, do you recommend the book? Yes, very well written. Thank you very much, Marek Dam. And now we are happy to welcome Jean-Éric Paquet, Director General for Research and Innovation in the European Commission. And we have asked him to answer the question whether EU research and innovation policy is what can bring European competitiveness to a new level. And hopefully we have established a connection. We cannot hear sound in the hall right now, just saying, just in case. Can we hear a little bit more from you? Yes, uh, hello, it's okay. Thank you no, very much okay. for the invitation. Thanks a lot to Kate and Vivian. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Uh, so the, the main question is, um, uh, is as I said, um, can European um, the poli policy of innovation can, can it uh, take Europe to another level in terms of competitiveness, and how can it do it? <laughs> I, I think it is already uh, making a big difference. I think maybe I should start to. I mean, in terms of competitiveness and productivity, I think the correlation between. Uh, uh, well-framed uh, and significant investment in research and innovation, public uh, but also industry-led, is, I think, uh, straightforward. And there is absolutely no doubt that across the European Union, we need to continue to invest in research and innovation. Uh, I mean, Estonia is doing reasonably well huh, in comparison to other member states. I think you're ranked number eight in terms of um, general government uh, expenditure on research and innovation. That's good. Uh, you can certainly do more and, and will want to do more. And I think here maybe what should be highlighted is the very concrete impact which research and innovation can have um, on public policies and outcomes in society connected to uh, the discussion you had on um, Mariana Matsukato's book. But I would like to illustrate that maybe with the most tangible amazing success story ever in European research and innovation, uh, which is the BioNTech vaccine. Uh, I suppose that in Estonia, like everyone else, you call it the Pfizer vaccine. The reality is that um, this vaccine was developed, the science behind the vaccine is 100% European, developed by a European biotech company, BioNTech, supported, by the way, also by European Union programs, including the European Research Council, because it's really a bio and tech company anchored in science, and they decided early 2020 to repurpose their messenger RNA technology, which they brought really to the highest level, to produce that vaccine. So, the, and the production is taking place also in Europe. So, it's a remarkable uh, success story connecting deep research with um, technological development and then uh, industrial rollout across Europe. And, and this is really helping us in Europe now dramatically in, in confronting the pandemic and the 
uh, further waves of the pandemic. So maybe here the message is um, uh, don't hesitate to boost yourself, um, including with that uh, European science um, uh, outcome. But uh, I don't want to be too long. I'm sure you, you would prefer an exchange of uh, questions and, and answers, and I'd be ha really quite keen um, uh, to also come back, back on the European uh, missions because we have, uh, inspired by Mariana Matsukato, and we were working with her back in 2018 as we were preparing Horizon Europe, and the missions are therefore very prominent also at EU level. Uh, yes, I, I am asking a question about this uh, vaccination success that you mentioned as, uh, as a first and foremost uh, success of European innovation. But um, we all remember uh, from a time one year ago uh, the overall skepticism about European part in this. Everybody said that Europe is slow, that uh, we didn't trust private sector, we couldn't cooperate, uh, that Americans did it much better uh, and the Brits did it better. Um, Actually, it has turned out quite a different story uh, to be. Uh, but wh why, why, why was there uh, such uh, criticism of Europe in the beginning? Because I think we have generally uh, in Europe a, a narrative that uh, whilst we are super strong on science, and uh, the best science is, I think, the consensus. It's the best science is taking place in Europe, of course, not only in Europe, but very much in Europe. We have this narrative we are good at innovation and that we are indeed uh, struggling in translating science results um, into society in, and, and, and that industry uh, is challenged to really pick it up and deploy it at scale. Uh, around the vaccine, you had on top of that, of course, also um, a number of choices which were made by Europeans in terms of regulatory approval. Uh, we wanted market authorizations. We, we, we therefore took a few more weeks than our um, uh, British uh, partners and a few more days or weeks than um, in the United States. And of course, um, as in the build-up to the responses to the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of, um, of political posturing as well huh, um, with our partners um, uh, outside of Europe. And again, this notion that the Americans are able to invest at scale very fast, including public resources, uh, into um, uh, science and innovation de uh, development is, is of course in part correct but the Europeans are quite good at that as well. And again, if you take the case of BioNTech, uh, this was a long-term uh, support from the European Union programs of our nearly two decades. But what we also did um, in April of 2020 was to make available 100 million euros um, from the European Plan budget to accelerate um, the clinical trials and the preparation of production. And on top of that, the Europeans did these advanced purchasing agreements uh, which were highly, highly innovative. This, this had not been done um, at EU level, across, supported by all 27 member states, which has proven to be politically so important as we then rolled out. And it's true that um, in the first phase of the vaccination campaign, everyone uh, was confronted with a slow um, increase of availability of vaccines. That was in inevitable to move a new in Russia. But this uh, challenge was not just a challenge in the European Union. You had it also in the UK and in the US. And we ended up um, with, uh, in fact, exporting um, uh, more than a billion uh, vaccine doses across the world. No one has exported, no one has made available the same level of vaccines to the world than the EU whilst vaccinating uh, in real time uh, its population. So it's, um, it was a challenging start in a policy area which was novel and against narratives which are uh, not the ones um, which I think are conducive to, to being uh, open and positive. But I think we now need to use this um, outstanding success to spur national administrations uh, stakeholders, um, of course, also EU institutions, to really take that uh, amazing outcome and try to replicate it in many other areas. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have been uh, trying to establish what would be these missions of European yes. innovations. Um, what are these? What's, what are the most important missions of the EU innovation? So we have, uh, we have five uh, European missions. So very much inspired by men on the moon, uh, I would like to, I would even say women on Mars, if you, if, if I might want to make it a bit more modern. And uh, in, in good discussion with uh, Mariana, which really helped us at the time. And they are about, there's one mission on uh, climate neutral cities. We have uh, a few days ago launched a call for expression of interest, asking European cities to come forward and declare their ambition to be climate neutral by 2030. 
I mean, so super ambitious and an extremely fast forward of the transformation which is ongoing in many cities. The idea is to find these 100 cities. I very much hope we will also have um, cities um, uh, from Estonia coming forward. And then, if you want, engage in a contract with these cities under which we would make available research results, knowledge, technologies, but also work we did uh, in society, make this knowledge available, make also the broader toolbox of instruments at EU level, uh, EIB loans, the regional policy funds, um, the Connecting Europe facility, uh, the Digital Europe program, of course, also funding under Horizon Europe, and then combine it with um, a, a debate with citizens in these cities so that we have, uh, we can design fast uh, transformation plans, mobility, energy, digital um, waste will be key, allowing these cities indeed to move to low carbon um, uh, economies and low carbon societies by 2030. So the mm -hmm. mission, these European missions are about connecting research results, available ones, and deploying them fast and deep uh, uh, within societies. We have a, a mission also on, um, on climate adaptation, where similarly we want to help European regions, 150 European regions, to invest in their climate resilience through nature-based solutions, amongst others, which have also been uh, researched over now many years. We have a mission on soils, um, helping Europeans to, to restore the quality of their soils, largely agricultural land, but also industrial or urban land. We have a mission on oceans, cleaning up our oceans, and we hope to work across Europe's sea basins to really make a big impact on, on cleaning up uh, our waters and our oceans. I very much hope that there will be a Baltic um, uh, effort here uh, as well. And lastly, we have a mission on cancer. We're connected to the Beating Cancer Action Plan. We hope to help with 3 million uh, Europeans by 2030 either avoid cancer through prevention or have access to better cures and better care after the illness. So as you, as you discussed uh, in your previous uh, session, this is really about setting a date, 2030, concrete outcomes, and then work across the entire toolbox to achieve these outcomes. There are two very specific um, uh, points on, uh, on, uh, on missions. The first one is that it's about connecting EU-level instruments with national, but more important to me, local-level uh, deployment and engagement. So that's really where I think these missions can make a real difference on the ground, but also in showing to Europeans that Europe makes a difference for their well-being and their future. And secondly, uh, I said it for the cities mission, but it applies across the board, and in Mariana Mazzucato's methodology, it's a key point as well, is to work with citizens. If you take notably the green transformation of Europe, no doubt we have um, many technologies which are now maturing, which we will deploy in these missions, beyond the missions as well, obviously, but in these missions. But these technologies carry us so far. What we also need mm -hmm. is societies and individuals to, to adjust and, and change. And this is where working uh, in the missions and preparing their design and their local design and implementation, we hope can, on the one hand, uh, ensure greater impact of the mission because the delivery will be carried by the citizens, but also bring citizens um, into it so that they own the transformation and adjust uh, accordingly. So that's really a big policy experiment um, uh, which uh, the Commission has now engaged in. And they are research, but in fact, public policy missions much more broadly, as argued by uh, Mariana Mazzucato as well. Uh, what's the part of uh, private sector, of private business in this mission uh, that you explained? They absolutely, they, they need to be obviously uh, at, at the center of it. Uh, in fact, actors uh, at uh, city and regional level need to pick up the mission and then engage and deliver it. And, uh, and, and private actors will be essential, both on the research and innovation side, notably on the technological development. We are working um, with the private partners in all these areas already today. We are working with the pharmaceutical and medical industry uh, traditionally, and they are part of the, the cancer mission. 
We obviously will need the transport industry, the energy um, uh, industry to be part of the cities mission and the climate adaptation mission. And we will work across the agro um, uh, uh, economic uh, sector and hopefully also um, with um, uh, the, the blue economy generally, including um, uh, fisheries. They need to be part of the exercise because they are key drivers of uh, of uh, the change, uh, a change which is today impacting a lot on, on climate uh, change, sometimes also on biodiversity loss, and they can therefore also be key drivers in the solution to it. So, so the, the private actors are fully uh, part of the mission. And I think the challenge today is we, we, we start kicking them out. Right? It's, it, we, we decided the missions uh, only back in September. What we now um, are, are at is to find in member states the uh, communities and actors which want to really pick up the mission with us and then roll them out. And that will be cities, regions, so very much um, local public policies. It needs to be supported by national governments, including in terms of funding, but also political support. But then we need the actors, and the actors are uh, economic players, citizens, civil society as well. They need to design the mission uh, in Estonia and help us deliver it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, can you please uh, elaborate a little bit more how this mission should should be uh, going? How how to get it uh, going? Uh, I, I understand that it's in the begin in the early stages at the moment, and you are still starting yeah. to look for partners and, and something like that. But um, how uh, do we get something done? Let's say in, so let's say in, in two years. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're looking to 2030, huh? so we have a bit more than two years, uh, hope, l luckily. Yeah? But if you want, l let me take um, the city's mission, huh? which is maybe the, the one which is slightly more advanced than the other. So we will know, um, I think, in March, which European city wants to be part of this accelerated transformation towards climate neutrality. So uh, let's imagine we have, um, uh, we have Tallinn, uh, let's imagine Tallinn steps forward, mm -hmm. is retained. What, what will then happen is we will, of course, start with, um, with our interlocutors in Tallinn, and probably this will start with the uh, local municipality and actors around it, to do a stock taking of the ongoing transformation effort. I mean, I, I know that the uh, uh, public transport system in Tallinn, for example, is very advanced. Um, you have uh, you have free public transport uh, as, as yes, one. We do. Uh, we will discuss also with the authorities how how the digital uh, are uh, put in place for, for these mobility systems. We would then, of course, also work um, uh, with um, industries uh, across uh, Tallinn uh, to have a, a better uh, understanding uh, of their carbon footprint. And, and then in the, in the course of 23, there will be uh, platforms available, including funded at EU level, to allow these various actors to engage in, the, in, in drawing up the concrete implementation plan for each of these sectors with the actors involved, bringing uh, the, the city uh, to, to reducing its uh, carbon emissions. This needs to be done at the same time with uh, citizens because of, of course, the deep impact these changes have on our everyday life. So they need to be part of the conversation uh, to ensure that they carry the changes uh, politically and personally, that they also can see themselves pick up the technologies which are which are offered, and on that basis, then the implementation plan can be funded under EU instruments, but hopefully also with um, national investments, including the recovery and resilience plan, where there is a lot of funding uh, planned also uh, in Estonia for research and innovation and technological deployment type of uh, investments. So that's what I hope we will do in in 2023. Really design at city level the uh, implementation plan to accelerate that transformation towards climate neutrality. I just add here that we, of course, have uh, accepted a degree of carbon offsetting uh, because by 2030 this will still be necessary. But with that carbon offsetting, we would, I very much expect, have 100 um, climate neutral cities by 2030. And imagine if that is successful, the impact it will have on our broader carbon um, uh, impact. And I think this will also have a very, very strong impact in bringing then many other cities beyond these 100 in accelerating their transformation. Voila, I think I'm a bit over time, so I stop. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, what do you say uh, to those critics uh, that say that EU has made uh, loads of plans, strategies 
for uh, everything, for, in, for innovation, for, for economy, uh, for transformation, uh, and yet they say we are lagging behind in terms of technology. For example, uh, we're out of competition when it comes to ICT or, or artificial intelligence uh, if we compare us to the influence of the United States or even China. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, you have to have an answer for them. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the answer needs to be drawn up by all of us together. I think there are two dimensions, huh? at least. I mean, the first one is that uh, we sometimes... Uh, uh, undervalue um, the, the 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 collective uh, uh, the collective capacity we have in Europe because we look at it either through EU programs which are only a, a small fraction uh, of public investment in Europe. Horizon Europe is 95 billion euros. It's a lot, a lot of funding, but it's only let's say around 10% of the expected public funding over the next uh, seven years. So, and then we sometimes look member state by member states. We see this as fragmentation. I would argue that if we were able to really collectively uh, invest um, in, a, in a more aligned manner in artificial intelligence or quantum, and this is happening, huh? it's not something which is just uh, a, a, a necessary uh, development, it is also largely happening today, then we, we compare differently to our, uh, to our competitors and partners in the US and in China. So I think the first thing is to team up more effectively, to have critical mass to make a difference, but benefiting in that from the diversity which is so valuable in research and innovation. So that's maybe one, one first element. And this is where Europeans have decided to uh, renew the European research area under which precisely we want collectively, and member states are very keen to do that, to find these areas where we need to get to critical mass by better aligning what we do at national, at EU level, in public and private investments, in alliances and partnerships. Secondly, I think if you take innovation more specifically, it's true that um, Europe um, has been uh, historically challenged on digital innovation. I mean, we have a few exceptions like, like Skype um, uh, from, from Estonia, yes, but we were, we were challenged on that, um, on that innovation wave. Uh, we are today um, catching up to an extent, but I think where the next innovation wave is, is at the intersection between digital and science, which is called the deep deep tech uh, innovation, where uh, in, um, in in biology, um, in 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 aviation, in mobility, uh, but also in IT, we will much we will have to connect uh, the physical world with the digital world, and Europe being an absolute stronghold in science and engineering, and we are quite unique from that point of view. Uh, has, I think, the capacity to be fully part of this next deep tech innovation wave, including one which will carry our digital and green transformation. And this is where the Europeans have created um, now a, a year ago, a couple of years ago, uh, the European Innovation Council, uh, which aimed at being Europe's uh, unicorn factory of the future, building on our strengths in science, engineering, and uh, uh, creating a different um, uh, narrative on uh, bringing this uh, into society through innovation. Yes, um, um, but um, uh, all this thinking of, of uh, setting up uh, your missions, of of, uh, of uh, making the plans towards it, it um, there is an underlying uh, assumption that we can predict the future, that we know what the future brings. But um, um, no, the no. last two years has uh, been has manifestly <laughs> proved that this might not be the case. Maybe with all those five missions, we're uh, running somewhere where we don't want to go. Well, I think. Well, I mean, on this, let, let, let me say that I, I, I would. I think we want our cities to to make a difference on climate change, don't we? We want uh, our regions to be uh, resilient to, to climate change. It's happening. We know that. The IPCC of Glasgow I mean, has indicated extremely clearly that uh, 1.5 degrees will, will already bring very significant disruptions. Every tenth of a degree beyond the 1.5, which cannot unfortunately be ruled out today, even more exponential uh, disruption. So we, we want to invest in our climate adaptation. The same goes with our land, which if we want to have quality uh, food and be able also to, to feed ourselves, again, including against the stress of climate change, uh, we'll need massive investment. So I think, and, and cancer, I think, just goes uh, without saying, we, we need to, to ensure that Europeans are less impacted um, uh, by cancer. So I think these five areas, 
they make uh, complete sense in the longer term. Where you're right, where there is a challenge um, is how to get there. And where there is a traditional uh, challenge um, is which technologies are the right to get there. So we need certainly to keep a, an open mind, whilst at the same time as uh, policymakers, but also in, as I said, in dialogue with uh, industry, private players and society, citizens themselves, we also need to make choices um, to move forward with technologies. We have, of course, in, in all research and innovation systems, you need space for basic research, fundamental research, the one which, bring, which will bring the knowledge and the technologies which we will need in five or ten years and cannot imagine today. That investment is absolutely critical, but we also need to uh, be much more um, efficient in, in finding the, the way to mature technologies which are visible today, but then more than mature them, find the way to bring them into reality. And this deployment effort is indeed one where public and private uh, need to come together and where, uh, yes, choices um, uh, are being made uh, and, um, and, and hopefully uh, these choices in the media will, uh, and I would argue that uh, if you take electricity <laughs> well, mobility or empowered uh, transport both make sense and both need to be uh, in sync. And this is also what the missions will be. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jean-Éric Paquet, thank you very much for this uh, great conversation. Uh, I'm sorry, we're having a little connection problems here. That's why I intervened at the moment. Uh, we started to, to uh, we didn't hear you so well in the in the end. But uh, actually, it has been a really great conversation, and hope you uh, all the best and and that you succeed in fulfilling these missions. Uh, and why not uh, even a couple of years earlier than uh, 2030? <laughs> Uh, so good luck to you and thank you. Uh, yeah, Kailit. Uh, um, uh, and dear participants uh, here who are physically present and who are watching us across the internet, now we're going to have a, a brief uh, chat. We have the Prime Minister, Kaya Kallas, and also the uh, uh, Kadri Simpson, who is the Commissioner. Uh, for energy at the European Commission, and I would like to invite uh, Katri Simpson first on the stage. So, if you could uh, sit next to me. And uh, the Prime Minister is getting uh, mic'd up uh, and is joining us now. So, we'll hear if there is a crisis happening. So, we uh, we do have the Omicron crisis, says the Prime Minister. So I'll start with uh, Kadri, uh, since Kadri uh, arrived first. So the simple uh, uh, question is that I understand the, uh, the uh, Russia turned uh, everything off yesterday. So do you have time to sit here and have a chat? Well, uh, Russia or the gas from gas uh, supply to Europe is not uh, happening over one pipeline, there are different pipelines. Well, I understand there is none happening right now. Well, as we have been uh, observing it, Gazprom is fulfilling the long-term uh, contracts. And uh, recent months, we have seen increase of volume through Turkey. Well, they want to also sell. So that means we're not going to be left without gas this week. As a citizen, I have this question. Well, yes, indeed, this is how things are. Because uh, our TSOs for gas, uh, before uh, winter, they have the winter outlook, uh, outlook where they say what kind of uh, risks are. So if all the long-term contracts will be observed and there are not going to be any unexpected maintenance which will uh, cause problems, they're not going to be a very cold and very long winter which would uh, demand extra volume, then everything goes as usual. But the fact is that the Gazprom fulfills their long-term obligations, but they are not willing to offer additional volume to the market or 
although the European uh, market has enough uh, purchasing, uh, uh, wish for purchasing, and the price is also high. Okay, I hope uh, that you have found out what we can look forward to. So you were not here when uh, Glenn Liarat said uh, his opening words, where he also listed the uh, number of crises which have impacted us across uh, over the year. There was corona, there's uh, climate, there's energy crisis, inflation which is a very serious problem in Europe in uh, looking at the politics and economy, Ukraine, hybrid crisis, migration crisis, uh, that crisis as usual. So during this year, Kaya, as you have been uh, observing these uh, issues, how are the European leaders cooperating when it comes to the crisis solution? The European leaders have a very good cooperation because if you think about um, every crisis, then we come out of this crisis uh, as we have learned from the previous crisis. If you look at the solution of this crisis, then this is based uh, greatly on the solutions of the debt crisis. So if you look at the hybrid attack uh, from the from Belarus, then this is based on the lessons we learned from migration crisis. So it seems to me as uh, almost a year I have been sitting at the uh, council table, then the uh, cooperation between the leaders is very good. And Europe is ready to act uh, strongly and make decisions very quickly. And this is something which uh, people tend to complain about. But if you think about, uh, for example, the joint purchasing of vaccines, people were making fun of it at the beginning. But now, it's Europe has uh, bought vaccines not only for Europe, but also has looked after the rest of the world. And this is not only promises, but actually with deliveries of vaccines or donations of vaccine. And this uh, Corona vaccine certificate, uh, how quickly from the idea we reached the decision making and the solution. It took two months. And this is all was something which is now functioning. We're all using this. So it is stem seems to be very popular that we want to uh, uh, say how uh, things are so bad in Europe all the time. I do not really agree. And uh, when I went to attended the World uh, Climate Conference, uh, COP, then how Europe is united when the uh, leaders of the entire world are present, then I have to say that this is uh, really amazing to be part of this family. Because once you're there, and, uh, for example, you're waiting your turn to speak, and then there's Merkel and Macron, and everybody else comes and hangs around with the other European leaders. We're all fighting for the same thing. That's a quite a ma- important thing, because other regions are jealous of it. Yes, indeed, but it could be that it's nice to be together, but it doesn't have also content, subject matter. Yes, indeed. If you look at the vaccines, it has a subject because other countries and regions have a problem with it because others are adopting our solutions. Because um, if you look at the recovery facility and uh, everything concerning these topics, because we have had a lot of solutions coming very quickly. Because it's not that easy. Of course, we have very serious debates. It's not comfortable to be there. But if we are outside, we're facing the outside world, we, uh, we tend to work together. This is our strength. So what Russia tries to do now, because Russia tries to split us apart, uh, do that to Europe and NATO, and this shows that this is not in our own interest, because if it is in the interest of Russia, because it is our interest to be united. Kadri, you have been now working in Brussels and Commission, go uh, Commission taking the uh, lead role. So how has it changed your way of thinking? How would you really uh, describe the uh, way uh, Commission uh, approaches the problem solving? I think these are the lessons we have learned, because if you are brave enough to take on the role of the leadership, how others would align after you. Because when the lion said that our objective is climate neutrality, then people looked at us as if we were crazy, that nobody else would go along with it. 
Of course, the elections in the U.S. Uh, were helpful, but um, even the Saudi Arabia and China has established their climate neutrality goals. But if you think of the uh, leadership role, Ursula von der Leyen has a desire to keep Europe united. And as Kaya already mentioned, that we learn from the previous crises. And of course, the Germans had an experience from the previous financial crisis which says that you can use the measures which not allow you to sink so deep. If you think about uh, the previous crisis, then Germany used their budgetary funds a great deal, and we had uh, imbalanced recovery in Europe, and there was a bit of a resentment when it came to these countries who handled the crisis better. Uh, of course, you could have ended up being uh, with a two-speed Europe. Because we saw that coronavirus um, crisis could, could uh, mean lockdown for Europe and the world, and there are some sectors who are definitely among the losers here, then the uh, Commission uh, suggested the pan-European solution, which was adopted, and that means we had to be able to adopt a long-term budget or the multi-annual financial planning. And the instinct that the nation states had was to lock the country down, that maybe this uh, means that the disease will not hit us. But that was also uh, something which had to be solved, that, uh, that uh, everybody stayed at home, but the Commission I did not really have this opportunity because we had to uh, be the uh, role model and show that we can work together in, even in the same room. Then there's also the approach to vaccines because I can see if there are some things which work out well, then everybody wants to replicate it. When it came to vaccines, then Europe contributed whatever needed to contribute so that uh, labs would develop the vaccines. Now we say, let's do the same thing. Let's do the same with the gas deliveries with anything else we need. Let's do the same thing. But not all the goods uh, can... Uh, uh, this, is, this is not something we can replicate because vaccine was something which did not exist yet. It had to be developed. If we talk about the natural gas, then this is uh, something which already exists. We just don't want to pay very high prices for this source of energy. Well, it looks like we are paying. Well, no, because uh, LNG uh, tankers will be uh, uh, heading our way, but the Chinese are paying more. So what are the deadlines then? When do the tankers come here? Indeed, this is the uh, something. Uh, these are goods you can buy up. And I've just been to Qatar. Then Qatar has uh, started uh, the construction of 20 new tankers for LNG. So I suppose that they can see that there's going to be a long and profitable market for them. So if you look at the European com uh, economy, what is the situation currently? I think the figures speak for themselves. And this is a very good example uh, because the European uh, new uh, budget and the recovery of facility does not have to enter the market yet, but it has this calming impact. It uh, provides assurances to our businesses, and this is a prevention of panic for our people, even in the situation where some people were uh, unemployed, but they knew there's going to be a security network available for them. So therefore, their situation is much better than it could have been otherwise. Yes, indeed. If you look at the European economic growth, uh, third quarter was 3.9%. In Estonia, it was 2.6%, higher than the EU average. So our neighbors, uh, Finland and Sweden, or Latvia, Lithuania, uh, so they had 4.2 to 4.6 percent of economic growth, but it was growth all around. So these figures are speaking for themselves. So economic growth, which is positive, but at the same time, we all see what comes with it, because the increase of energy prices and inflation so this is an uh, issue for everybody. How long this inflation will take? Is it uh, uh, going down? Is it uh, ongoing? How can we control it? So this is something which causes uh, worries. If you talk about the European machinery, and if we look at it from the outside, then sometimes uh, things seem to be very slow because you list uh, the figures for economic growth. what we can look at across Europe, but at the same time, 
Uh, if you look at the uh, recovery facility, we are uh, about to uh, start using it now. Should we not use it then? I think that this uh, physical presence of uh, availability of funds, the message to the market, are two parallel positive developments. Without this uh, message, then I think that this um, uh, anxiety could have uh, caused a greater recession than without the message. How do we know it? We know it because we can see that uh, people are prepared and the companies are ready to react uh, when it comes to the messages about the future. And in the energy sector, uh, the, we need to provide assurance to the market where we should invest. What kind of investments uh, would also produce yield uh, decades from now and where we should not really uh, put our money anymore, where will be stranded assets? But shall we really uh, invest billions into boom economy? Well, the recovery facility question is very good because on one hand, I can say that the recovery facility was established at the moment when things were very hard. And I agree with Katri. This gave a signal that don't worry, we'll get you overcome the hardship. And this is the lesson we got from the debt crisis. But uh, the message alone uh, was okay because then there is actually this issue coming up because on one hand, when the economy is becoming overheated, we should not add heat, and uh, how to find the balance here. So what I can see on the national level, and I can see that uh, the other prime minister of the European Council have the same issues, is this expectation is that everything will be paid up full because I'm not in business uh, if, unless you pay me to be in business. So there seems to be a new paradigm which has arrived. And I would say that um, here we are making this mistake uh, which we will be learning from uh, during the next crisis. But we can't say it's a mistake, but this is something which we cannot um, uh, undo either because uh, a lot of things in the recovery facility uh, are very targeted. They need to be used in order to implement certain structural changes in our economies. So would it be the uh, green transition or digital transition in our economies? Because these are the things which have uh, been stuck uh, and needed funding. Well, we're going to talk about greening and, and digitalization more, but um, I'm not sure if the uh, funds can do that. Can the funds make us greener, more digital? We'll discuss this later, but it looks like inflation has been impacted by this influx of funds. So, um, What could be a solution for this sharp increase of inflation? Energy prices are currently hiking up inflation. That is the main thing. Why is inflation so high in Estonia? Because our energy prices percentage-wise have increased more. And why is everybody working on the energy prices now? Because it's a big part of the inflation. And if we can control it somehow, then it will have an impact on inflation as well. In the long run, there's no other solution or answer or response than to invest in energy sources that are more environmentally friendly, but also more affordable. And uh, the increase of energy prices, at least in Estonia, has made a lot of people think about energy savings. If energy is so affordable, there's no reason to think that maybe I uh, should uh, not uh, keep the sauna on at all times just in case. Or uh, how, how did it go? I have four fridges and a TV in every room and everything is on all the time. So maybe this is something to think about. Do we use everything that we um, actually have uh, running on energy? And these are things that can also affect inflation. But there's also a different point of view. The fact that we see the increase in energy prices is just a reflection of uh, this uh, public funds offering by central banks and governments 
and this causes this situation. Why should anyone sell anything at a normal price? What we currently see with energy prices is our dependence on import of fossil fuels, and that is why the recovery facility says that every country there must put 37 percent into climate-related expenses. We can say that uh, we want to create alternatives, importing natural gas, oil, um, products and coal uh, to replace them, and we will pay back uh, the uh, recovery facilities alone. It's not free money. But in uh, previous years, Europe paid the imported uh, 300 billion a year. Europe paid on coal and oil products and natural gas that was imported. If, if we replace part of it with locally produced energy, then uh, it uh, shows us how this investment in the future pays back. The financial situation where we have high debt burden on public sectors and high inflation, then uh, what do you think is the solution? European leaders and institutions, are they willing to do something forceful to control inflation? If we simplify it, then there are two solutions. We continue with inflation hitting those who collect savings, or we uh, s become more strict and we uh, hit those uh, who have loans. So which direction is Europe heading in or what direction it should head in? When we're discussing the long-term uh, budget, then um, there were uh, four stingy countries who said we uh, need to uh, not spend so much. And uh, what we see in Europe is that the countries that have a very high debt burden, uh, Paolo Gentiloni uh, is my neighbor in the college, and uh, um, from time to time he uh, shares some things with me. And he said that 10 years ago, when uh, Italy's uh, debt burden of uh, GDP uh, was two times lower, the interest was two times higher. Um, and uh, loans are just uh, so affordable, and the countries that don't have a high debt burden, uh, some countries have more than 100%, uh, don't feel the pain because right now it's uh, very affordable to uh, um, pay the uh, interest on the loans. Uh, should the interest be uh, raised? Well, this is a question of how Europe wants to uh, move forward um, in a united front. Well, uh, it takes the majority. Kaya speaks to the other prime ministers, uh, and uh, it's more about uh, this internal policy. But listening to my colleagues, then it seems to me that um, what is prevalent in Europe is that a loan for a good goal has served us well. Uh, what does an economic liberal think about this? It's interesting. Uh, you probably hear the same words, but uh, understand it differently. The same words are spoken, but you meaning is completely different. On Thursday, we had a meeting uh, with Christine Lagarde present as well, uh, the Eurozone uh, summit. and. Um, and the forecast on uh, how long the inflation will last and what the outlooks are, then the hope is that when the energy prices go down, then inflation will go down as well. But on the other hand, the message was that then we need to uh, work on interest rates. This um, money supply at this level, in the end, ends badly. This is what I heard, but it seems that Kadri heard the same words but understood it differently. So you believe that interest rates will go up? Um, well, that issue uh, will come up. Um, this is how I perceive the situation. But it does have a lot to do with uh, different stakeholders, etc. 
Kadri says stingy, uh, but uh, actually these discussions in Europe do revolve around the idea that we cannot live above our means forever. We're about to change the topic, uh, but I'd like to uh, remind uh, the audience that you can send questions to our speakers and hopefully we'll have time at the end uh, to uh, answer some of the questions. And um, uh, if you want to ask a question, then uh, go to uh, sli.do and enter the password you see on screen right now. Uh, so uh, send your questions there. Uh, but I promised to change the topic now, and that's the Green Deal. In general, it seems uh, that uh, in crises and all these things, Europe has been reactive. Europe responds when things get out of hand. Then uh, Europe gathers itself and uh, reacts. Um, but such a big thing, like the Green Deal, how do you manage it? It's not about just reacting to a city flooding or something like that. We need to shape a completely different way of life. How can Europe manage this process? Well, the Fit for 55 project uh, introduced by the Commission in the summer um, has never been uh, managed uh, before um, in cooperation with uh, member states and, diff and the parliament. So different uh, committees uh, and committees of the parliament will be discussing uh, all the different uh, topics uh, that we need a consensus on and to uh, achieve the results uh, as well in just a number of years. And you said that the decision-making process in Europe is very slow, but uh, we made this uh, proposal in summer. My own initiatives uh, mean that uh, countries should contribute more to energy savings. Um, and uh, uh, it will probably take a year before we have the trilogues. Uh, but uh, when there is the will, we can take decisions very quickly. Just uh, last uh, Tuesday, uh, 15th of December in the morning, um, uh, we finished uh, a dialogue uh, in a year and uh, state aid uh, permissions can be issued even more quickly and uh, during energy crisis and during COVID pandemic uh, we have seen how countries provide information to the commission that they have a state aid initiative and they get approvals extremely quickly. So COVID uh, gave this practice and uh, now in the energy crisis, 20 member states have used uh, proposals uh, uh, that uh, we offered in our toolbox and have received the permission almost momentarily. Kaya, speaking about quick decision making, um, the parliament, uh, the EU Affairs Committee just put the brakes on in Estonia. Well, uh, how to manage it? Yes, it is a very complicated question. On the one hand, the guiding principle is that uh, we want economic growth to continue, but to harm nature less. That is the gist of the Green Deal. We want everything that we're used to consuming, electricity as much as we do, energy, but we want to do it in a way that uh, we preserve the natural environment, we don't exhaust it. In principle, everybody agrees, but the devil lies in the details. Also, this collection of proposals, this set of proposals, when you read the general description, then it proceeds from from increase of welfare. But when you read the proposals one by one, then uh, you 
don't see welfare increasing uh, in any of the proposals, rather that things get more difficult. So that's the problem. When you look at the problem, the proposals one by one for sectors and then send think this message that uh, things will become more complicated for you and more expensive for you, more challenging for you. So it's understandable that every sector will start fighting it. And we know that uh, in uh, contemporary information society, it's very easy to um, latch on to a detail and uh, just uh, sink an entire package of ideas, as Moises Naim wrote in the book, The End of Power, then contemporary managers, uh, leaders have less power because you have small groups um, who can host, take big processes uh, as hostages. Uh, and. Uh, they get disproportionate amount of attention in the media. They focus on details, and it seems like there's a lot of people behind their idea, and they can overturn processes. How to change the situation? Well, it's complicated. You need to speak to the stakeholders. You need to explain. Uh, you need to make sure that you don't hurt different um, parties. And it needs to be the Green Deal of the people so they understand that they gain something from it. But it's very difficult to explain it to people because uh, if in the short term there is a price increase or you have to take on some loss, then the long outlook seems too far away to uh, suffer the pain. These small groups uh, that uh, take the entire process uh, as a hostage in Estonia, in general, we support Fit for 55. But when you look at the it sector based, then we weren't happy with much of anything. No, that's not true. Not at all. We do support uh, the proposals generally, but currently we're entering negotiations which will be taking place for the next two years. If we do not outline the concerns that we have with something or another, then later we won't be able to do it anymore. We can uh, take a step back or forward or uh, come to a compromise, but if in the very beginning we say we're happy with everything, then there's no reason to negotiate anything with us. And it's the same if we say that we don't agree to anything, then there's also no point in negotiating with us. So it is about striking a balance, outlining the concerns, and we're not alone with our concerns. If uh, we look at forestry, then um, Finland, Sweden, Latvia think like us. If we speak about maritime affairs, then uh, Greece thinks the same as uh, we do. So it's going to be a very complicated process of negotiations. And when we look at the whole, then it's also understandable that if we do less in one part, then we need to do more in another part. And those who need to do more with something else must agree to this push and pull. But the response to this question, how to manage it all on the European level, I mean, as well, and also nationally, then that is, uh, well, will be very interesting to see. A question to both. But why the Green Deal discussion in Estonia has gotten off track in some way? Uh, speaking about planned economy, expensive, uh, um, removed, uh, in just enthusiasm-based, cannot uh, be put into practice. Um, all these uh, notes of criticism, is it a lost battle already? No, I do not uh, think so. There are many things that uh, we will uh, negotiate with member states, and many of these things are already being worked on in Estonia. And I believe that the goals for 2030 um, are not too challenging for Estonia, because the energy economy plan um, has uh, already foreseen for very high decrease in uh, volume of emissions by 2030 in Estonia. So uh, being able to continue the lifestyle we prefer presumes that we will replace fossil fuels with something else. But it also means we need more sustainable, more energy-saving solutions. Last week, we proposed um, a building renovation program, which is basic in Estonia. If at all you have the means, then you try to insulate your home. 
now additional resources will be allocated to those who might live in regions where apartment buildings and apartments uh, don't uh, have much of a market value. Uh, but uh, now we are also allocating uh, funds to renovate buildings in less favorable areas. It's a Green Deal victory. Uh, you live in uh, an area w that is depopulating and you get additional support to improve uh, the, your housing. I think um, in the end all these things will work when people understand what they stand to gain from it. or if banks and um, financing institutions uh, join in, which they're doing already. So two things, more and more people want products and services to be more environmentally friendly, not so wasteful. So it's bottom up. And I think the second thing is the energy crisis is a good example of it, that uh, energy is expensive. Why is it expensive? because it's not been produced from renewable sources. That's what makes it expensive. So people have also started thinking about this. I went to a factory in Viljandi that produces solar panels uh, that are also roof tiles. And they said that uh, they are like uh, ice cream sellers. When the sun comes out, then uh, they have a queue um, at the door that everybody wants solar panels, but because of the uh, power crisis, they already have a queue behind their door. People have started thinking about uh, that, um, how uh, to um, have more sustainable um, energy saving solutions and the uh, financing institutions uh, participation um, that uh, environment will be considered when issuing loans. So loans for polluting projects will just become so much more expensive. Raising capital will become so expensive that everybody will start thinking about it. So the this uh, criticism that it's planned economy, we don't need it if the desire is bottom up. And uh, in the sectors where we need a bit of a boost for people to even start thinking about it, there we need to push a little and in the sectors where we don't need to push we don't need to push that much and one more thing a development of technologies as well when we look back in history then in energy sector all developments have come from crises you say that you're in this comfort zone there's no reason to do anything to change anything that uh, you criticize that uh, europe responds it's reactive but it makes sense everybody responds when there's a crisis then they start thinking about it yes uh, the people who do it preventively uh, are wise but then people don't come along with you people come along jump on board when we are in energy crisis and start thinking that, well, maybe I should take some steps because it means uh, more affordable energy for me. The new year will uh, bring new presidency of EU. And also in the context of uh, French uh, presidential elections, uh, um, how do we uh, like the um, presidency objectives? Uh, well, from a practical point of view, the focus is on the first two and a half months of the French presidency, very busy days. In my area, what I like is that they uh, Um, are uh, really uh, setting stakes on individuals gain from European policies and uh, they cover buildings from my area of work across uh, European support for all buildings uh, moving from G class to uh, higher efficiency class so in G class you spend six times more energy to reach a normal temperature in a building compared to a new building. So this is a noble goal that they have set. And in the coming weeks, Kaya mentioned uh, that uh, we will be providing additional guidelines to financial institutions uh, where to issue uh, favorable loans to. And the French optimism um, towards nuclear energy will pr probably also be one of the slogans of the presidency.
Yes, it's going to be uh, interesting in the sense that uh, France is very ambitious. And as Catherine mentioned, uh, then uh, they want to do it all uh, within the scope of two and a half months, considering the presidential elections in France. Um, I'm sure many things overlap with Estonia, but we uh, need to keep on top of things uh, to make sure that our voice is heard. But what we're really looking at uh, um, is strategic compass developments and defense topics, considering what is currently taking place uh, around the Ukraine and what uh, Russia is doing. So we need to keep an eye on uh, developments there. And now looking at the uh, Slido questions, I'll just combine some questions, some critical but recent questions have been posed. Uh, but they're quite similar with each other, so I'll just choose a couple. Global climate neutrality requires harmonized activity and united front. And uh, running in front of the engine, isn't it uh, suicide? Probably the references to European Union. And uh, what do Estonian people gain from the Green Deal to have the motivation? Nobody wants to pay more money. And next year, how will the middle class in Estonia cope with the current inflation? Well, a number of questions. But all in all, the question is, while well, trying to be at the forefront, progressive, Europe as a whole, in global context, and also us within Europe, we are causing issues for people's uh, um, standard of living. Um, Estonia middle class, when we look at what's important, is that uh, salaries are increasing quicker than inflation. And um, currently, that is the case. So this should mean that people's standard of living uh, does not worsen. But like I said at the beginning, energy prices and inflation are concerning, and this is what we're working on, uh, trying to help those who need assistance the most, and at the same time, uh, also on a national level, trying to solve energy sector problems uh, that uh, have been at a standstill for years. So trying to uh, get uh, to overcome the obstacles uh, that we've had for a long time. And this joint harmonized uh, action, uh, I agree that we do need this. Uh, we do need simultaneous joint action. But somebody needs to lead it all. And uh, in many of these topics, uh, Europe has been the leader. Everybody is waiting around for somebody else to take the lead. But then we see on a global level as well uh, that others come along with the climate agreements because people more and more are asking for it because they see what the repercussions could be. They don't want flooding. They don't want the forest taken down. They don't want energy prices to hike up. So these is the, this would be the outcome if we don't tackle these issues. So the most tangible thing is decrease of energy prices, actually. But there, there are sort of reiterative statements um, in Estonia that the quota market, carbon quota market, is structured uh, in the wrong way. You cannot forecast the price on a certain time scale. Then nobody can invest in more sustainable capacities, production capacities. So, which, how should the uh, quota market be reformed to give back the security of investment? We're monitoring whether there are no speculations there. Currently, there are no signs of it. The quota market reform it means expansion, transportation, and buildings. Coming back to the previous question, Europe is not alone anymore. We have global competition. Who is the leader, us or the US? 
preparing the energy dialogue with the US, we see that their readiness to contribute to hydrogen, for example, hydrogen production is so much higher than uh, our targets. And uh, Estonia is no longer the good kid in Europe. The 2030 uh, energy uh, plan is good, but the uh, Finnish um, climate neutrality target is 2035. So we have uh, not exceeded ourselves. Well, the quota fluctuation is concerning. And the debate isn't about uh, having higher pollution production facilities pay more, but knowing what it is. What we should reform is uh, that uh, you don't have a market there, but you have a fixed sum per unit, per certain unit. And that would give some security, some confidence, because currently we have two. When we look at the graph, then the quota price has not increased as much as the gas price has fluctuated. But when you have two variables, the energy carriers prices on the market, and then you have the CO2 price on the market as well, then there are too many variables. And it causes insecurity. And I think we do need to give it more thought. I have to go to the next meeting, says the Prime Minister. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we will uh, let, you, let you go so you can uh, tackle the different crises. And hopefully by the time we finish here, you ha will have resolved the crisis, oh, of course, wherever you're heading to. And uh, there are many more good questions in uh, Slido. Maybe organizers can forward them to you, though currently I can't uh, see who have asked these questions. They're anonymous. But thank you very much. And now I'd like to ask the next panelist to take the floor. So now we're going to get more into details and we're going to talk about different options. And we're going to discuss uh, different types of crises we need to handle. So I would like to welcome here Andre Suit, the Minister for Entrepreneurship and Information Technology, Henrik Hololle of uh, DG Move, and uh, Timo Besonen of uh, DG Defis. And uh, we'll now continue in uh, Stone, and we have simultaneous interpretation of available, and I'm sure that Timo is going to speak to us in English. So uh, welcome all. I'm happy to see you here. So we'll start with the same question for all of you. And uh, we'll, we'll be a bit mean as well with the first question. Why is Europe talking more about innovation than rather is actually innovating? Why do you think so? Well, this is what I think. So this is just uh, to cause some intrigue. So uh, if you talk about innovation, it seems to come from uh, China or the United States. So if you look at the uh, tech companies, and then they're not coming from Europe. I do not quite agree, because we should also look at where the European strengths are, and Europe has many strengths. Because if you talk about innovation, maybe this is not the most kosher topic today, but I think it's very important because in uh, the world, we have nobody comparable to us when it comes to the development of nuclear technology. The French are number one in the world, and they have the most uh, state-of-the-art technology. In my own field, I see the same thing, that in the world, the most innovative and most successful um, uh, Airbus is the uh, the best producer of planes. And uh, if I look at the railroad, then the rolling stock, uh, Alstom, Siemens, uh, they attack, uh, trains are the most modern when it comes to the technology on the world level. If you look at many other fields, for example, French companies like 
Dallas uh, military industry. The Morgan to talk about this quite a lot. But again, it's uh, Rafale fighters, for example, because they are also competing very well with the rest of the world. So I think um, I think in Europe we do have really seriously considerable innovation technologies. But the problem is the same. We are fragmented because we don't have these economies of scale. Everybody does something quietly in their own corner. And that means that it will not be visible somewhere where we can say it's European innovation. Everybody wants to say well, that this is what we are doing here. They want to put their own stamp on it rather than saying that made in Europe, we should sell a lot better than uh, many member states separately. So I think these are these questions. and. Uh, the monetary issues as well, because so we have the biggest wallet right now uh, in order to support uh, research and development and innovation compared to the previous years. But at the same time, this is what is being done on the European level. Now, if we were to sum everything up, uh, which is going to do on the national level, then this is tenfold more. But at the same time, it's fragmented again. So this is the problem we have in Europe, and this is not something which is very easy to overcome. Because if we were to cooperate, then it works. Coming back to Airbus, four European countries joined up, and 40 years later, we had the most successful plane produced in the world. Dimar, how come that F-53 fighters are coming from the United States, not from Europe? And Finland uh, buys these uh, uh, ones, not Rafael's or anything else. Luckily, luckily, I don't have to answer on behalf of the Finnish government <laughs> on their decision. And uh, I'm really as much aware of the decision as you are based on the media information. Of course, it's a good question. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's part of the what Henrik spoke about, Europe being maybe too fragmented. Uh, what we are doing together with, with others, we are in space sector, for example. I mean, we were in Porto in the European Space Agency ministerial meeting when, uh, when Mr. Minister announced, you know, the, the Estonian uh, objectives to find new unicorns also in, uh, in the digital economy and, and maybe even in space and, and defense industry. So I, I wouldn't be so gloomy. I think we have also the highest world-class level of universities and technical universities in Europe. We have the know-how, we have the skills, but we, st of course, still needs to be better mobilizing the venture capital and to support, you know, financing of the startups and scale-ups, both in the in the defense, dual use, and and the space sector and the whole aeronautics, which Henry referred. We have Airbus, yes, but we need we need we need new success stories in a European European scale, and and in the field of defense, I'm I'm very positive on the first experience of the European Defense Fund which is an eight billion fund for this uh, budgetary period, uh, where the idea is to, to get really, you know, uh, not only research and development, but also the capabilities developed in Europe together in a cross-border way, having Estonian companies together with French, Germans, and you name it. Mm. And there, from there, finding really a real, real success stories for European defense, space, and aeronautics industry for the future. So I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic than you might think. Do you see any big success stories coming up which the world would wonder? Well, I would comment here. Um, I would comment here, yes, there are some big European success stories coming up, which will be the wonder of the world. If we talk about new technologies, and one field I have contributed a great deal because I believe in it is everything which has to do with drones and the use of drones. Because in Europe today, we have the uh, most um, efficient uh, safety systems, uh, uh, most efficient uh, use of air, airspace, uh, how the drones should operate. And the, the rest of the world are looking at because helicopter, uh, for example, in the drone world is the because the head office is in Germany, although it's a global company. And uh, Brazilian uh, company Azul bought shares in that as well. So in this uh, field, Parrot is a European company, so there will be uh, uh, but these are commercial, but not uh, military drones. Dima, I'll come back to this question that are there any good examples of uh, coming up success stories of the, the world to talk about five ten, or ten years from now, especially when it comes to defense? Well, in the field of defense, I mean, we have a, we have a merging uh, SMEs uh, across the Europe. I don't want to mention any 
companies by name because we are also supporting the companies with an EDF funding. So I don't want to be taking any sides because there is a tenders going on for the EDF funding for next year. So, but there are, I mean, Estonian companies have also done very well. And the Estonian presidency was, let's say, the very important kickoff moment, which, uh, which case reminded me when we came here together. Uh, and, uh, and there, for example, uh, what, comes to, what comes to drones, what comes to cyber, cyber defense, uh, there is a, 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 a special niche for, uh, for, for our expertise coming from, from this part of, of Europe. Andres, you know that very... Andres, you are brand new politicians, and I think you, you still recall this kind of uh, hunger and uh, impatience uh, which people have who are not in politics regarding the processes which take place in the politics. But now, if you see the European innovation and policy and uh, business development, so has this calmed you down now? Do you believe that everything is fine and you ca we can't do things anything better? It has actually inspired us because if you first asked why in Europe uh, things are not uh, organized as well as in the United States, then I believe that um, we should be uh, actually more self-confident because at the begin uh, to start uh, we have to say what Hendrik mentioned. So to round up uh, uh, things, I take the UK back to the uh, European Union. And we have half a billion consumers who have the biggest purchasing power in the world. This is the market to talk about. And this market grows and develops. And everything we discussed so far, talking about the startup sector, so that we have uh, seven unicorns from Estonia by year 2025, we should 18 and more. So to have 25 total. So they come from different fields so that um, we have plenty of innovation. And the talking about aviation, Hendrik mentioned Airbus. Uh, Airbus as a traditional company has shown that it is very important for them that in order to position themselves among uh, when it comes to their competition to the newcomers, Within the company, they have created innovation and uh, startup division. So I believe that in Europe, these possibilities exist. We need to talk more about them. And I think a great shortcoming for us is that we need to tell the stories more. We have to bring these examples. As uh, Timo, Timo didn't mention the names, but I know at least three companies from Estonia who are doing very well when it comes to defense. And I think I can mention these names because we have visited the different countries with, uh, with them. We talk about Mildrem, Marduk, Talgen Technology. So when it comes to the field of defense, then this is very important, especially when it comes to dual purpose. Because if something works well in a military setting, then it works really well during time of peace. The same is true for space. Uh, space is very important field where innovation happens, and we depend a great deal of it. Because if the space doesn't work out, then nothing works here. Navigation, football. Uh, all the money transfers, all goes through space. So all of it is there. We just need to get going. I still have a question. So if you talk about space, are this, is this real? Is it real in the sense, if you talk about the subject matter itself, or do we talk about tempting stories, attractive stories, in order to create this impression that we do new things? I think inspiration is very important because if we had not been inspired by uh, reaching the moon, we would never have been able to get there. Because if we limit ourselves, if we limit our horizon, then I think that we will be incapable. But uh, space is very practical because if you look at the last flooding in uh, Germany, and it also concerned the Netherlands because when it comes to the space, here in Porto Center, they showed pictures. Uh, based on the, which you can actually detect this kind of floods a lot earlier, so you can actually have time to do anything about them. Because climate warming is an important uh, topic, but things which happen that you can see them coming in advance, so they are uh, you can forecast them better and react to them better. So this is a very practical matter. Or if you're using uh, pictures taken from space, 
in order to measure whether the support in agriculture has worked out. If, for example, you've had some sort of uh, uh, grassland support, you can see that, yes, indeed, uh, uh, from the space you can have a good resolution photos so that you have uh, had hay made in a field. And in Europe, we have to work harder because uh, half the satellite center space which work there, which have provide a practical view, there is only one company which has sent the satellites there. And that's only one company is uh, SpaceX. So we have to invest more to the space industry in Europe and our own capability to send satellites up. Timo, does Europe uh, do that? Is Europe doing, going to do that? Actually, we have a bigger space program than ever in, in the European Union. We have uh, roughly uh, 14 billion for this budgetary period to support our space flagships, which is the Galileo, which is more precise than GPS. When you put on your, your navigator, it's a signal comes from European Galileo satellites. We have Copernicus, which is the Earth's observation, which you mentioned, which was instrumental in observing the floods and alerting also the authorities. So there is also preemptive, um, you know, uh, importance, as, uh, as Anders said. And, and, and we are also building new constellations, the secure connectivity, which Henrik is supporting, which is, will be a space-based secure connectivity between the governments, European institutions, plus then a commercial uh, element, a public-private partnership, which will bring broadband everywhere in Europe. So there will be no more white spots mm. in, the fl in, in the flag for, 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 for broadband. It will cover everything. So it will be huge potential and also covering Africa and the, and the Arctic. So we, we are there in de developing the new, new flagships, but we are not copying what Americans are doing. We don't have that kind of billionaires. So we have to do it differently. We have to do it in, in a European cooperation. Of course, learning from the from the experience of, uh, of, of American uh, uh, and, and, and a global businessmen, and they with all respect to them. I mean, they, they, are the, they are discovering the new frontiers, but we don't have to do exactly the same. We can find a European way of uh, pulling together our resources. And, and we have also launched a, a, venture, a, a venture capital fund called Cassini, one billion funding for, for space startups and uh, scale-ups. So there is, there, is a, there is a booming space industry in Europe. And you see it also in Estonia. I haven't yet had a chance to visit. I will do it in spring. We agreed already. So that you, because there, everywhere you go, I was in Prague, in Sweden, everywhere, there is really a big interest among the young entrepreneurships because they look, you know, the, those Musk and Bezos and the others. Mm -hmm. Of course not, you know, maybe at the same level of ambition and not availability of the funding. But they are really, really developing a world-class disruptive technological ideas, which will, uh, which will strengthen the Europe being the, the number one in the a number one innovation and entrepreneurship hub in the, in, in, in the world. The American, the, these billionaires, they are heavily supported by the public authorities. For example, in U.S. by NASA, by Pentagon. So you know, we, we also have to to pull together our resources to be able to compete globally. Enrique, in your field, uh, does it happen that uh, when they think that okay, uh, space is space, but let's better have a good train, which uh, takes uh, place, people to places? Well, we do have trains, as we mentioned that before, that we produce uh, the most contemporary and best trains in the world. And there is plenty of innovation to get around. But the space issue is not so alien to us either. There are quite many things which are linked to it. But also people have asked me, when you talk about aviation, so what are the changes which will come up in the future? And one of the answers I have said is that the space where we fly is going to get bigger because they talked about drones. So that means we're going to use the... Uh, Currently, this kind of uh, airspace, which is uh, low altitude airspace, uh, which not in use currently. And um, what is the next uh, step? Is that we're going to use this kind of airspace, uh, which is uh, just before the open space. Um, and today, oh, uh, supersonic planes are under development, but uh, not in Europe. All the Europe has been uh, uh, the front runner here because the only 
commercial supersonic plane, plane has been in the Concorde, which uh, was here for decades but uh, had to close down because Europeans uh, did not like a lot of loud noise. And Europeans are a lot more sensitive in this regard than Americans. But the thing is that it was a seriously noisy plane. And today, the noise level is something which is an obstacle when it comes to supersonic uh, aviation development. But this is something which is going to come up. These companies like Boom and some others uh, have uh, already uh, talked about the future plane, which is going to use the upper level of uh, um, airspace. Um, and uh, Timo and Andres uh, are co governing both these uh, areas. So we're keeping an eye on it because a lot has to do with the safety of things, which we have to keep an eye on as well. So innovation, or if we talk about the space technology and military technology, then I would say the biggest added value here is that the innovation which is done because of it uh, later will uh, roll over into the commercial use. A lot of uh, um, activities are related to the uh, space technology first and uh, uh, military technology. Whatever is being done now will benefit the regular people later, not only the uh, space people. We know that during the COVID-19, a lot of flights have been cancelled. A lot of holidays, a lot of business meetings and conferences have been cancelled. But uh, what has been this uh, more permanent impact of the COVID-19 crisis when it comes to the transport uh, sector or mobility in general? It's a very good question. You cannot really answer that because the COVID-19 crisis is not over yet because it's ongoing. And this is um, we have to uh, join our forces and to accelerate the uh, vaccination progress starting from Estonia all the way to Africa. So I think this is the biggest problem right now. And I think these conclusions can be done over long term because conclusions right now are premature because what we could see is when uh, things worked out really well and the gold standard European uh, uh, digital COVID certificate. So the moment it was put into use, then we could see the number of flights was increased because it said they said people are afraid to fly. No, the demand has been very high. Ryanair flies today more flights than before the pandemic. Well, it's the, it's the only aviation company do, doing that, but they fly. So that means that people do want to fly. They want to move around. They want to see other people face to face not looking at some uh, screen where you can't uh, uh, tell the eye color or whether you can trust this person or not. So this is something which is uh, going to be with us also in the future. So um, uh, this is uh, our first uh, thing we notice. But every crisis change habits. And uh, it's believed it's going to impact mostly the most profitable segment in aviation, which are the business travelers. And it's hard to say, but I think we can see a more of a drop there compared to the uh, regular b b tourist travelers, because that co recovers a lot uh, easier and faster. And another thing which is going to uh, come with us is all sorts of restrictions to health, and not necessarily restrictions, but kind of measures which concern health, which we never even noticed or they didn't exist before. As we all recall, uh, after the uh, September 11, uh, we uh, are used to taking the liquids out of the bag, which we should uh, not really do if the uh, airports could uh, invest in the CT um, uh, technology as they have done it in the United States. But when it comes to the health side, because the declarations probably will need to be filled out for years, and this is the uh, uh, causes additional complications for traveling because this is uncomfortable. And I'm sure we'll have certain certificates and things we need to show, which is also in use on a global level. And when it comes to the entire sector, because sector has to be flexible. These companies do well, which have been flexible. They've had uh, more of a cash reserves, 
prior to the crisis, and they've exited the crisis without getting any state aid. And there are some others who have been receiving a lot of uh, dropping. So I think uh, this is the message to the many other aviation companies. You have to be prepared when the times, times are hard. You have to be flexible. And you need to invest into innovation as well, because this is what we talked about uh, during the last panel, especially when we talk about green transition. Then aviation is uh, one of the sectors which need to contribute towards the green uh, transition, as this is a sector where the emissions are likely to increase in the near future, and where the uh, leap in technology has to take place. New types of plane have to enter the market. What it means in the context of COVID is that the process is going to be accelerated. And I think that over the next five years, we're not going to see a big change, but the next 10, 15 years, the change has to be there through the new solutions and uh, using also cleaner jet fuels. This is something people are dealing with right now because this is going to be a new uh, uh, economic branch which offers a lot of new opportunities. And Estonian companies uh, will be able to uh, uh, think, uh, help us to think through it because we have many big companies like Alexela, and I'm sure that they will be also interested in offering sustainable jet fuel for the future. But before we're going to talk about strategic autonomy in our field, which is very important, there's one more thing because this has become a joke already. That if there is some sort of trouble brewing, then regardless what it is, the price hike. Or any other issue, or something is not functioning, or there is somebody's messed up. They say that the um, justification is supply chain. It's always the supply, chi- uh, supply chain, and this is how it's going to be. So when it comes to the uh, mobility, so did you move in two years? Why have you not fixed the supply chains? What's happening with the supply chains? Well, fortunately, we do have the market economy. And the market functions um, as well or as poorly as it can in a certain given time moment. And uh, everything has its own logical reasons. When it comes to the supply chain, then this problem is going to be with us for a time to come. And it means uh, movement of containers between Asia and Europe. We talked about energy prices before, and we all know that the energy prices have gone up. And today, uh, we are not talking about the impact on the consumer so much. Um, uh, for example, the prices of sea container have gone up eight or ten times compared to the previous pricing. The containers are not uh, available. Uh, people pay whatever uh, in order to get the goods out of China. And it's the same thing there, because if we uh, talk about the high gas price, then uh, one of the reasons is that China buys LNG, which is available on the market market with any price. So the reason is that the containers and the transport to the United States have been more expensive uh, than to Europe, and profit is uh, uh, higher. So that means that the free containers have gone to the other side of uh, the Pacific Ocean rather than crossing the Indian Ocean and coming to Europe. So these are the problems because they a lot of uh, containers were moved out of the system uh, during the coronavirus because some of them were old, um, some were not necessary. And what you talked about during the previous um, panel, the economic growth this year has been very fast, not only in Europe. Forecast was 5%, but across the world, economic growth was uh, near uh, 5 or 6%. And this is a lot higher than forecasted, and this means that demand has uh, exploded, and right now there are no uh, uh, ways to uh, service uh, this supply, uh, this demand. So we are producing containers, so therefore we cannot bring more containers to the market. But at the same time, we have been keeping an eye on it uh, if it's if it's any prohibited activity, because at the end of the last year, when the signals came, we asked our uh, colleagues from the competition DG to look at it. And this was really considered because it, this is not uh, a deliberate uh, a market distortion because this is just what happened because these things are as they are. But there is a but, as it was mentioned before, 
whether uh, Russia is manipulating the gas market, then I can't say because um, Russia for a very long time during the Cold War has been a very secure supplier. It's their, in their own interest to be a secure supplier. So therefore, I'm somewhat skeptical, but who the hell knows? And the question is whether the Chinese are manipulating the containers and deliberately are not allowing these containers enter the market. And one of the reasons why there are less containers around is that the harbors do not have the capability to service those containers, so therefore they get stuck, and maybe China is doing it deliberately. Well, I would say that they, we, as far as we know, they're not doing it deliberately, but you don't really know. So when it comes to the strategic autonomy, I think this is one of the phrases we'll hear more over the next six months than we had before, or whether we want to. Uh, so, Timo, what does it mean if we talk about strategic uh, autonomy in the field of defense? And what are the opportunities uh, for the small country in this field? This strategic autonomy, or I, I often rather speak about strategic sovereignty or technological non-dependence, because that's what it what is all about in, in practical terms. So I think what, what we need to do in Europe is to strengthen, as Andres said, our, our space capacities, because we, are, we have to admit it, we are technologically still dependent on outside European technological solutions in the field of space and in, in field of defense. And this is the unfortunate, unpleasant truth at the moment. So I think it's worth for all of us together to strive for change, to strive for more top class, top niche technological solutions in Europe in the field of, in strategic field of defense and space to support us. And, to, and I think the kind of the days of naivety are over in Europe. I think, uh, I mean, in, in this country, I don't have to mention it anymore. You know what I'm talking about and you have never been naive here. Go a little bit north, I hope, also there. <laughs> but I think seriously, seriously, I think, uh, of course, it should not be protectionism. Mm. Because that's not for, for, for Europe. Europe is not protectionist. And Europe will not be become any more protectionist if we want to strengthen our, our technological non-dependence. Non so it's too easy to, to claim protectionism if we are supporting our strategic uh, uh, developments, technological developments. So I think there is a kind of a nuanced discussion. And, uh, mm -hmm. and when it in the field of, 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 let's say, this ecosystem, what we are here, aeronautics, space and defense, it has, this topic has been there for, for a long time. It's not nothing new. But when it's kind of broadened to kind of more generally the economy, then there is a more ideological discussion coming of free traders against protectionists, etc. But I, I want to focus on the concrete things, what, are, what is happening, what is happening in Europe. And I think it's worth of, of pulling our resources together and finding the ways to support the, uh, the European solutions in, uh, in, in critical technologies, uh, mapping them, uh, finding the way how to support. It is, to, you know, it is the supply chain also in this field. Uh, COVID showed how vulnerable we were. Uh, and there are other examples. So I, I think it's, it's something, uh, let's leave ideologies aside. Let's look pragmatically what can be done together. Yes, but uh, I'm sorry, I'll ask in English because it's much easier. Um, but, um, well, the critics uh, say that uh, as it is presented or, or probably meant uh, by, his, uh, by its most um, vocal proponent, uh, President Macron, uh, mm. is that um, perhaps he, he has in mind that he can, uh, uh, he can make money for uh, French uh, military industry uh, through this program and there's nothing in it for uh, smaller countries. Um, and, and, and it doesn't change anything globally because uh, this French military industry has uh, lagged behind. <clears throat> well, the, the French military industry is the strongest military industry in the current European Union. That's for sure. But it is not it doesn't mean that, you know, when we are doing the European, European level cooperation with the European Defence Fund, with our space programmes, that we are not supporting the other member states. And seriously, I mean, the, for example, Estonian space and defence companies are well networked 
with the French and the Germans, Italians, and you name it, the, big, the bigger players, and building up together the capabilities to, to let's say, to strengthen our non-dependence. So I think there is a, a, a real potential. We, we make the, the cake bigger for defense and space industry in Europe, so then everybody will benefit. Mm -hmm. Strategic autonomy, ettevõtluse või tööd. Strategic um, approach from industry point of view, does Estonia have anything to lose or gain? Well, taking a few steps back first, with all of this strategic autonomy debate, it should be looked at defense. It should be broader. NATO is the umbrella, and we must unite under this umbrella. There's no question about that. Now, COVID has been a great accelerator. We have the different supply bottlenecks that uh, were mentioned. In hindsight, it's clear that they existed even before the COVID crisis. Globalization at its time and after the fall of the Berlin Wall shifted a lot of production and manufacturing to the countries where production is cheaper. It happened here. Investments came to Estonia from Finland and Sweden, but also on a global scale where a lot of production went to Asia. But what went with manufacturing and production and something that wasn't really foreseen at the time that innovation also went with the production. And that is one reason why in certain areas we currently have sort of played ourselves into a corner. If we take the semiconductors, our microchips, we're completely dependent. Solar panels, the same. Uh, rare earth metals, um, magnets, these are all areas where it is clear that we need to bring, not bring, we need to create alternatives closer by. So the fact that in Europe, our companies can choose from different producers when we speak about uh, uh, solar panels or semiconductors or magnets, that opens up a world of possibilities. In Estonia, MPM Silmet, for example, it's the only company in Europe, or maybe there's one more, that is capable of processing rare earth metals and capable of producing magnets and permanent magnets. And this company is expanding. Now, you ask what Estonian companies can uh, gain from the global repositioning or relocating. Then I'd like to give the example of uh, Pfizer BioNTech. Pfizer BioNTech would never have been on the market if BioNTech, as a small company, had not been willing to share its vaccine ownership with Pfizer. Because BioNTech did not have the capacity to scale up and bring to the market millions or hundreds of millions or billions of dosages. Pfizer did not have the vaccine. The two met, and uh, this is where the solution came. And uh, Estonia is the place where you have a lot of BioNTechs. And we need to take advantage of the Pfizer's in Europe, where they're speaking about German or Finnish companies, French companies, to create similar cooperation mechanisms. And I think everybody can gain a lot from this. And especially in creating high added value jobs and making use of the recovery and resilience facility and all other funding uh, that uh, we currently can bring here with the current um, monetary policy. So this repositioning will take place anyway. The question is, what chunk will Europe and we inside Europe take out of it? And I think we should take a big bite. I agree with the previous speakers said, and I'd like to add a couple of things. The production repatriation has been a process that's been taking place uh, far longer than the crisis. In the US, for example, uh, before the previous administration took office, a number of American companies uh, uh, went to Mexico um, 
came out of China, which uh, was geographically closer and politically more stable, even uh, if the production cost was a bit higher. Still, they had a better supply chain. But now, if we put all of this into the big picture, then Europe is a spokesperson for free trade in the world. Spokesperson number one, the EU is the biggest exporter in the world. So the more free trade we have, the more open markets there are, the more successful European companies will be. And we know that very well. The US exports much less in different areas, in different sectors, especially ready-made products. And if we leave aside uh, military industry and all that, then we see how uh, successful Europe is uh, with consumer goods and uh, all kinds of technological and transport means, etc. Of course, globalization created new opportunities and uh, a lot of production went to China and um, that created the situation where we were interested in uh, entering the Chinese market, and that's why we opened our market. But what happened was that uh, more and more our activities on the Chinese market were restricted, and the Chinese more and more started operating on the European market, not following European rules, but wanting to introduce their own rules, and even uh, wanting to put pressure on European rules. And uh, it was clear that uh, this can't go on endlessly. And now what we demand is the reciprocity, uh, that uh, we have the equal opportunities, which of course will not happen. And as a result, we need strategic autonomy and uh, other accompanying uh, proposals that have been related to foreign trade uh, and industrial policy, etc. So it does not mean that we're protectionist in Europe. To the contrary, it means that we cannot allow ourselves to be milked, basically. We need to set rules that we will also follow. But with 27 countries, there's also some Hungary somewhere who will decide not to follow the rules, which will bring additional problems. But unfortunately, that's the case. And I think the direction that we have set upon is the correct one. The most uh, drastic example, Andres also referred to it, is the semiconductors, right, or the microchips that we really need to produce everyday products. If uh, one day China and Taiwan and the conflict escalates, then you 30 or 40 percent of the global market has disappeared, which was meant for the Western world. And uh, by then, if you have no other alternative solutions, then uh, we will face extremely serious industrial challenges in Europe. We need to take these steps to ensure at least some selection option choice. And we speak of natural resources. If you don't have something, you don't have it. You can't dig any deeper. It won't help. Now, the audience's question. We have a couple couple of good specific ones as well. Uh, Minister Sweet, exclamation point. Uh, Mark, what has the state specifically done so that Estonian industrial sector would be competitive in the EU and the world, especially ICT, is a tool, not the goal? Industrial sector, yes. Again, having visited all counties during this uh, year and visited uh, several dozen companies and uh, consciously a lot of industrial production companies, then we have a number of untold stories who are very successful on the global market. Just a couple of examples. so that uh, what I'm saying wouldn't be too ambiguous. For example, Baltic Workboats Company, which for me is a technology company that happens to also build ships, because the greatest added value they create for the customer is uh, their design software solutions for the specific vessel, so it corresponds to the customer's needs. Or on island of Sarama, the company Incap, that um, produces tailor-made solutions, very high quality solutions that require a lot of skill and very high standard uh, clients. You can do anything. Anything is possible. Or if we go to 
to another sector, Foxway, 100% circular economy, a company in Tartu. Um, smart devices, uh, laptops, uh, pa tablets, uh, renewal, refurbishing. We have a new generation of consumers who don't want to purchase brand new items. They want to repurpose existing ones. Foxway has had very quick growth from 20 million to 140 million in four years. Metaprint in Tallinn, in Ulamista, 70% of the market share in the EU in um, compressed packaging. Um, in construction industry, some cosmetics uh, products as well, um, pressurized packaging. So there are lots of uh, success stories. Um, the state has provided two important things. One is uh, labor issues. And the government at the beginning of next year will be tackling labor issues um, to um, alleviate the shortage of uh, skilled workforce. And uh, second is capital offering uh, that uh, and the new organization when we merge Credex and Enterprise Estonia will be dealing with uh, the uh, um, capital and, and keeping the world open and Europe open. These are the most important things. During crisis, we uh, need to give up investments like Rail Baltic uh, that uh, is uh, financially harmful. Uh, how long uh, will uh, Europe uh, avoid this topic. I saw the question, and it's uh, a person who is anonymous who has asked this. If you have courage, enter your name, and who are you to speak for the people? Show me one survey where most of the population thinks that Rail Baltic does not make sense. So I think that it's a very necessary strategically for Estonia and economically important for Estonia. And I hope that uh, Estonian political elite will continue to implement this project. EU has funded the project. The project will be implemented by Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. And if somebody wants to shut down the project, then it can only be the three Baltic states. But I know that in Lithuania, the support is over 80 percent. In Latvia, it's also very high. In Estonia, it's uh, much more than half. So maybe those speaking for the population should be more careful when using this phrase that they speak for the people. Thank you. So this was a forceful uh, closing to our panel discussion. I'd like to add that what to expect? 30% are against vaccination. What to expect then? They also speak for the people, uh, for the entire population, do all they can that our state could not open up. These are the times we live in. Thank you very much. And I'd like to pass the floor to Dimo. I just want to take this opportunity to, to thank Kate Kazamets for five years as a head of commission representation here in Tallinn for his excellent job. He has continued uh, very high level uh, professionals uh, being in the steer of the commission representation. I was the fortunate one to nominate him. And I know that uh, the, his uh, successor, Vivian, will continue the excellent job with a good team commission is having in, uh, in Tallinn. And I'm sure that uh, Kadri and, and, and Henrik and all the colleagues can be proud of the team here in, in Tallinn. Ja, suur tänu panelistidele osalemast ja ja äh Thank you very much to the panelists for participating and this time to uh, close the seminar and uh, I'd like to pass the floor to Kate Kasemets so he will have the opportunity to thank me as well. So uh, I'm happy to receive the floor for a brief moment. Thank you to all of the uh, participants, Minister Timo, Henrik, Prime Minister, Commissioner, of course, Eric, you as well. This is the fifth end of the year seminar that uh, I have been able to organize together with Glenn, and they've been really different ones. Uh, five years seems like a short period, but actually, it's a very long time. The first year was 2017. Estonia ha held the presidency then. Everything was very positive. Uh, we all praised each other, how we've done very well, and Europe has done very well. The things we now discuss, energy, green deal, digital decade, 
We didn't really discuss these matters m much. Estonia, during its presidency, did uh, bring the digital issues to the forefront, uh, or not to mention COVID. Of course, that's uh, this um, huge surprise. Now the situation is a bit different. The crisis has not ended yet, and uh, in the framework of this seminar, all these issues were also highlighted, which will also characterize the coming year defense issues, PESCO as well. So from Estonian presidency 2017, now all these are big topics that we need to continue working on. And I understand that this week the government's office will issue a new survey regarding Estonian su support to the EU. And whether there are any changes, I can't state the numbers yet. But we can say that despite all the crises and the troubles, the support has not actually gone down. When we look at the beginning of 2017 and compare it to now, then the support is still very high. So basically, we say eight people out of 10 support or rather support Estonia belonging to the EU. And I believe that uh, this is um, the outcome of everybody's joint work. And so on my behalf, I really want to express my gratitude to all cooperation partners, politicians, civil servants, journalists, dear colleagues. who we worked with over these past five years. And uh, I wish you perseverance and patience and lots of success, especially Vivian, who uh, on uh, January 16th next year will uh, take over heading the work of the European Commission representation in Estonia. And virtu virtually, I would uh, like to pass the baton over to her. So Vivian, we like to give you the floor as well. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kate. And uh, of course, I'd love to be in Tallinn with all of you already, but uh, I'm just uh, closing things uh, here, tying th things up and uh, I have a couple of days left here. A little technical glitch here, but I promise next year I will be in Tallinn just in time. Kate, thank you. You've done a lot of work like the previous heads of the representation, Hannes and Toivo, and working towards making sure that there we feel the EU dimension more in Estonia. This is work we should continue doing. And what the representation can do is to bring more understanding of the EU to national discussions. Because all of us here, we know that these countries gain the most from EU membership who are very active in Brussels in the discussions and constructive, and those who have a lot of support from home. And we can help with that. And the topics for the new year, you have covered a lot of them, like COVID crisis, of course, uh, will remain with us. But other topics I'd like to highlight are the security situation, we have a president of the commission after a long while who is transatlantic and sees the Russian threat with open eyes like we do in Estonia and in the current situation where Russian statements have become more and more aggressive um, is very important. Uh, just last week at the Supreme Council, um, at the European Council, van der Leyen introduced the new sanctions. So I'm happy to see that uh, actually at Berlamont on the 13th floor, Estonian views are reassured. And the Green Deal that was mentioned many times today, of course, we need to explain it and illustrate what Estonia has to gain even more than we have and how to do this. Estonian government this year has been very exceptional compared to many Eastern European countries because in all the Green Deal discussions, Estonia has been very constructive, has been thinking long, 
has really stood out, and this definitely helps and gives us an advantage for the future to also use the funds uh, meant for the Green Deal. And uh, Eric also referred to the recovery facility, uh, but on a critical note, I think it's very important that the money allocated to Estonia and the first contribution has, the, dis the uh, disbursement has been made to Estonia. It's important to make sure that the funds are used um, in a targeted fashion and uh, paid out at the right time. So we have lots of work to do, but many of you participating uh, today, I already have very good collaboration uh, with you and, um, and with others. I want to make sure that uh, we will start collaborating closely in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you and lots of success to you as the uh, head of the uh, representation. And uh, thank you to Kate. And thank you very much to all the panelists once again, all the participants, everybody who participated in conversation, and all the listeners. Thank you for thinking along and stay healthy. Enjoy.